We are going to move here uh, to Greg Smith, who's the founder of GS Solutions Group. Uh, I've met Greg once or twice over the years. He is an Agile in expert practices and adoption. He's a certified scaled Agile framework consultant, certified Scrum Master, certified Agile project manager, PMI Agile certified practitioner, and a co-author uh, of Becoming Agile in an Imperfect World. During his career, Greg has held positions as a product manager, program manager, development manager, scrum master, and project manager. He has received numerous awards for his work in helping startups establish good software practices and for helping large enterprises overcome bureaucracy and deliver urgent projects. Greg has served state clients, including uh, Healthcare Authority, WATEC, uh, the Attorney General's Office, the Department of Children, Youth and Families, and the Washington State Office of Financial Management. So he's been around, probably many of you know him, and um, if so, you probably know what a treat it is to hear from Greg in this forum. So with that, Greg, are you ready to assume control of the teams? I believe I am. Can you hear me okay? I can. Good. And before I start sharing too, just um, uh, Stacy, can you and Rochelle watch the chat box? Because I will stop two or three times to take questions and maybe you, because I can't see them when I'm in presentation mode. Yep. yep. So when I, good, good. So when I stop, then you can run some of those questions by me. Great. All right. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. And uh, Stacy, would it be okay if I, uh, diverted from my topic for just like two minutes to, to comment on something that Bill said. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Uh huh. Please do. Okay. Let's see. So you can see my PowerPoint, I'm assuming, right now? I can. Yes, sir. Good, good, good. So just a couple of quick points I wanted to make. I think, Bill, I think you really nailed some really critical things. Um, so many people, if you can see my six box diagram, I won't turn this into an agile workshop, but sprints at the bottom. So, you know, you plan a sprint, you deliver it, you demo, demonstrate it, go back to your backlog, pull some more stuff, and you kind of stay in that back bottom loop there, four, five, and six. But to Bill's point, your vendors should be doing the top three things before they ever do the first sprint. So you should still go through envisioning, or I think in the old PIM box, we used to say initiation. You should have a strong business case. You should clarify your key metrics and goals, how you're going to measure success. And even if you're going to the cloud or whatever, you should start like getting that built out before you do your first sprint. Like you have to have a basic system going to actually start deploying your code to and rotate across the environments. And then the last thing on box three here at the top, your vendor should be like after they've got the scope, a high level guess, you should do story pointing and lay out a forecast. Like say, this is how long we think it's going to take to reach the various milestones. So anyway, I just want to point out, I think Bill's like right on the money. Too many people are just hopping to sprints and using Agile as an excuse to skip the top three boxes. And that's not Agile. I mean, that's that's just doing Scrum, but Scrum's just a part of Agile. So you should be doing the stuff at the top too. So anyway, uh, just wanted to add to that because I thought Bill made such a good point. All right, um, so as said, um, and maybe real quick too, Stacey, I should make sure my slides are changing. I saw that question from folks, so I'm going to bounce back and forth just real quick. So are, are my slides rotating? They are. OK, good. All right. So uh, Stacy mentioned I've worked with so many agencies uh, for the state. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you that I that may be on the call today. So so thank you for letting me work with you. I'm actually going to cross reference uh, the healthcare authority actually in a case study in a few minutes, so that'll be kind of fun. And Stacy already gave you my background, so I don't need to give that to you. I, I've been doing Agile for 20 years. I think I've been working with the state of Washington probably eight or nine years now. It, it goes back, I, I think I came to a PMI chapter presentation, and next thing I knew, uh, getting a lot of phone calls, people trying to use Agile. So. So let's hop right into the topic today. Um, the things that you won't hear uh, necessarily in a book. One of the big ones 
And one that just surprised me now from the from the poll was there's a company called Digital um, dot AI, as you can see in the bottom of my slide here. And they do an annual poll every year. They used to be called version one. So if you ever heard of the version one annual agile survey, I think this was like, yeah, their 15th survey they did. Most of the people who respond are in North America, but they do have worldwide participation in their survey. And in their most recent survey, 86% of organizations are using Agile now in some aspect. And I don't think I saw that um, on, the, on the survey results just now for all the attendees. I would expect in government work for it to be a little behind. Not because government's not progressive, but like uh, we usually say things have got to be a lot more proven before we go out and try them. So um, I think government's moving there, agencies are moving there. At, as Stacy mentioned, I mean, there's a ton of agencies at the state I've helped use Agile. So I, I'm seeing a lot of it out there. So it's a, it's red hot. Could be what Bill said too, could be moving to the cloud because a lot of people are going to the cloud and that that is a good, uh, I guess, uh, environment for both for Agile and the cloud kind of go well together. So good news is we're all headed there. But uh, according to this same survey from Digital AI, um, people are experiencing a lot of issues or barriers. Uh, so I'm seeing uh, cultural issues where it's not a good fit for the, the current environment, for the vision or the identity that the org has for itself. Uh, and just in general, I think we're all kind of resistant to change, especially if we're comfortable in what we're doing today. And then the bottom two, I especially see a lot. Uh, and I think Bill mentioned, you don't want it to be an IT driven thing. And he is right on the money. At, at the end of the day, IT might say we need it, but leadership has got to drive it and say, here's the business value to the agency or to this organization for using Agile. So that's that, that third bullet is like at the executive senior level, but then at the working manager level or line manager level at the bottom, the, the same thing's kind of going on. So uh, we're actually seeing the people who, who are actually day-to-day -day management of teams um, really aren't supporting Agile very well. And it's funny, um, I'm working with a client right now and they are in what we would call value stream teams or pods. And um, all the pod team members have functional managers. So the developers have a development manager, a QA's got a test manager, business analysts report to a BA manager. And when they do their annual goals, their annual goals are only around like developing their skills as a developer, tester, whatever. So, you know, go learn Azure, go learn how to do test automation. But but they're not actually tied back to this pod that they're working on, the value stream and the, the business goals. So that that's a, a great example I'm seeing right now with the current client where the, the goal of the value stream or the product team isn't even tied into personal goals for people. And that's where I think management can make a huge connection is when they are actually setting goals for the year, for the quarter, actually tie the agile pieces into it. Don't just make it about skill set only. So, so these barriers that folks are encountering, um, th there are ways to get around them. Uh, and that's what I want a good portion of my discussion to be today. So how can you actually get around the barriers? Uh, so, First thing I want to talk about is uh, stop cheating, is what I will call it. Second thing I want to talk about, and where I will talk about uh, my experience with the healthcare authority, is customizing Agile to your environment. And then the last thing I want to talk about, uh, which actually might be the most important thing, is if you are going to try to use Agile on a project, at a team level, or across your entire agency, how do you motivate team members to support the move. So, so we'll wrap up with that. So let me start with uh, the very first one. Um, so I've been helping teams move to Agile. I, I think I'm getting old, uh, close to 20 years now. And 
at first I was just a doer, like I was a part of a transformation team. And then since 2008, I've actually been like leading transformations. And I've seen patterns that work well when I help organizations move to Agile. And it's usually following these three top level uh, patterns. So getting a foundation in place, doing early rollout or piloting to verify it works, and then scaling Agile, going to Enterprise Agile, maybe going to scale to Agile or SAFE, those of you familiar with it. So that's been something that I've learned. And um, so the foundation stuff, is, and I'll actually go through it in a little more detail here, but it is things like getting management buy-in, getting management trained, uh, thinking about your long-term goals for Agile. Early rollout is what it looks like here. You can see, and it, it, actually this example is from a real client. So it's it's going out and piloting, testing it on a few projects, verifying your assumptions, actually kind of using Agile to move to Agile. So doing a little testing, getting feedback, and then pivoting if you have to or continuing on. And then once you get solid with Agile with a few teams, then you can start talking about scaling it out, doing enterprise Agile, Agile portfolio management, and so on. So another client I'm working with right now is doing an Agile transformation, and they had to abort. Um, I was not helping them. Uh, before they had to abort. I, I came on and started helping them after they aborted. But when I got in and started looking, they tried to jump to the red column immediately. So, so basically they started trying to move to pods or value stream teams immediately without assessing the culture, looking at current practices, getting management buy-in. They just tried to immediately jump into implementing uh, and going to the third side or the third column here. And it was a disaster. Uh, the team started rebelling. Um, there was just massive tension. People questioned the processes they were being asked to use, and that there wasn't really a to uh, enough time allowed for what we call like awareness. You know, like kind of like talk about all the anxiety stuff, and then give them time for buy-in, and then then once they start using it, piloting, then then they start doing ownership. They were they were asked to move to ownership from day one, and they ended up crashing and burning. So some of the things, you know, like I'll kind of walk through this in a little more detail, but like on the foundation side, this is from a real client and I tried to redact their name. But we actually sat down with executive management and said, uh, let's put Agile Foundation in place. So number one, what does success mean? If we're successful with Agile and Lean, what is it going to mean here? So that's one of the very first things we did with the executive team. Then we put together a core team to facilitate moving to Agile internally, making it organic instead of having it driven by me, by, by like a vendor. So I helped the core team, I coached them, but my long-term goal was to wean them off me and get out of there. So it would be organic and it'd be better support. And you can see other things here, like you know, get managers and executives trained on Agile. Start creating cheat sheets. Start creating the organizational change management plan, your communication plan. Start telling people, you know, like doing town halls, telling them what's about to happen, like ask them what their fears and concerns are and, and start going through that awareness phase and the foundation phase. So um, actually, Stacy or, or Rochelle, this is a good time too. I don't know if any questions have popped up so far, but if, but if there are, I can I can take a few right now. I don't see anything in the chat, uh, but would invite uh, anyone with an immediate question to, to raise their hand. Oh, Sayi? Go ahead and ask your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Sai. I'm a, a CIO also in Gambling Commission. Uh, my question is, you know, uh, some of the uh, activities that you do for the enterprise sometimes are very helpful when the whole management know the agile culture and they know how to do it because they've done it. What is your strategy when the agency is completely unaware of what Agile is and uh, and uh, how do we really evangelize Agile even before we start doing all the activities, the foundation activities? Sure, sure. So um, well, some of you might know uh, Don back in Watech days, uh, and I worked with Don at Watech probably eight years ago. And this came up basically. I, I said I said exactly what you said, Sai. You guys need to understand conceptually how it works. You don't have to learn how to code, but you need to actually go through how we actually do long-term planning, how we would do a sprint. 
And so they agreed to it. We actually did one day of training that and they got dirty, did sticky notes, all that good stuff. And then we actually did have problems later, like with dedicated resources. And because of the exercises they did and, and the amount of understanding they had of Agile, they kind of got it. They didn't do classic management pushback. So you can see actually on this example from a real client, they did agree to it. We didn't consider it critical, but we thought it was high priority in the backlog to actually get all managers trained on the fundamentals and actually go through and do it. And most managers will say they're too busy to do it, but then they'll spend three to six months a year uh, with Agile working poorly just because they couldn't find eight hours. They'll spend 100 hours trying to fix out Agile instead of that eight hours that they could use to start. So I'm a huge fan of getting those that are actually leading the transformation uh, trained on using it. And we can do it so conceptually. They don't have to know how to code or how to automate tests or DevOps or things like that. We can, we can still fundamentally show them how it works. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, I don't see anything else in the chat, Greg. OK, good. So, you know, I've got here from this client. Um, first thing was to find success. So they did come up with KPIs and metrics, uh, but immediately we did an elevator statement. Th those of you who are familiar with it, an elevator statement really speaks to the main thing that you're trying to do. So so their executives came up with uh, this elevator statement and they shared it with the whole org at a company wide meeting. They called it the Agile 2022 program. And they basically said our drivers are we're trying to increase revenue and market share and we're going to move to becoming an empowered organization. So so one goal is to beat our competitors to market. But the biggest thing is actually they wanted to address the thing that Bill mentioned this morning, getting away from a siloed approach where we just kind of focus on our specialization and our function as opposed to the complete life cycle of like from beginning to end, getting value to the customer and thinking we're all big one big team instead of thinking about I just do my part and I don't worry about the rest of it. So so anyway, this is like one of the first things I would ask an agency or, or an organization to do at the start. If you're moving to Agile, quantify it to everybody like so they because they're going to ask you why. And if you can't answer why, they're, they're probably not going to buy into it. So here's an example of a foundation activity. I won't go through the rest of them, but just wanted to show you. These are the kind of things I see people skipping. And some people I think think they're fluffy activities, but I think they're they're more critical than understanding Scrum is getting that that why answered at the start. The second thing I'm seeing people skip is like I mentioned the piloting activities after they've got a foundation in place. People just hop and start trying to use Agile everywhere. And uh, you know, I'm sure everybody knows like the lean mentality or the lean lean startup mentality is you come up with a hypothesis, you create some way to test it, you take it out for a test, you get feedback. If your hypothesis is validated, you keep going forward and you scale out and go forward. If your if your hypothesis is invalidated, you either pivot and make make a slight change, or you maybe even cancel altogether. So we do the same thing. We're moving to Agile. We'll go find a pilot team or pilot teams to go test it with. We'll train their scrum masters, their product owners. We'll give the team all the support they need. Usually we'll give them like a short project or just a small milestone to try to get to. And then we'll get feedback at the end. Is this working? Does do two week sprints work? Is the product owner role working? Is the scrum master clear on what they're doing? Scrum master and project manager. Are you guys figuring out how to work together? So it's good to pilot because you don't want to like if you've got a bad process and you take it across 10 teams, then you're going to shut down your whole org. So it's best to grab a few teams and just try it. And I also like to grab what I call the low hanging fruit also like grab a team that's pretty close to being agile or or a cross functional team already. So start with a place where you think there's the highest chance of success if you're moving to agile. Don't don't go to a team that is like radically waterfall and violently vehemently against it. We want to we want to go someplace at the start, try to get some successes, and then we can go to the harder places to use Agile later. So same thing here too, Stacey, if there's any questions that this is a, a good chance for me to or a good moment for me to take those. Yes, appreciate that. Um, kind of an active conversation in the chat right now about uh, tools that you might recommend. We've got a lot of users of Microsoft Azure DevOps and maybe some Jira users out there. 
but are there other tools you um, love and recommend? Um, for I'd say 95% of the clients I'm working with, they're on Jira or Microsoft Teams. So I see other tools out there, but it probably because like I'm working with a lot of large clients, they're they're getting pretty serious tools and either one of those tools is fine. But one of the things I would say is if you don't have a tool yet, um, the teams I work with, especially when we're piloting, we'll try to leverage whatever we already have. So Excel, SharePoint, I don't care what it is like, but don't don't if you buy a tool in advance, you might find yourself trying to shape your process to fit the tool. I'd rather you like lay out a workflow that works really well for you. And then when you're done, you can have the vendors come in and show you how well they could support the flow that you've created. And then you can pick one that best fits. Mm -hmm. So so that would be my my cooking suggestion is if you can avoid a tool at the start or you can even use what you currently got. But um, I would I would try I would I wouldn't start tool first. I start process sticky notes or whatever or even if you're online there's there's you can use mural or Miro or whatever tools but use whatever tools you currently have before you go make an investment into jira or teams that's good advice greg i think um also considering the slide that's up on the screen uh one of the questions i saw go by a little bit ago was to talk about what are the essential roles on the core team on an agile core team that you prescribe to folks that you're working with Sure. Um, I don't know that I'll go that deep on that right now because that, that itself could be 45 minutes. But the one thing I can tell you, don't think roles, um, and hopefully this isn't insulting to people, but I want it to be mostly worker bees, like the people who actually do deliver stuff. So maybe there's like one manager, maybe your agile sponsor, your executive sponsor is on that team, but we're going to have much more success if the people who really do this are vetting the agile process and saying whether it works or not in the specific skill set. So I would want a tester, a dev, an architect, a business analyst. I would want good representation for all the doers, the people who really bring this stuff home on that team. And I'd even have somebody on there too who's anti-agile, like have at least one person who's really going to push the team hard and not just drink the Kool-Aid and say, oh, everything's beautiful. You you actually want somebody who's going to challenge what you're doing, especially if there's issues with it. So every skill set, mostly the doers, um, good to have at least one person on there who's really resistant to doing it and try to limit how much management's on it. So usually like this one person, one manager or like your executive sponsor. Thanks, Greg. Um also, a good question here, maybe this is the right point to ask it, is what are the KPIs that you use to define success at the beginning of an Agile transformation? Sure, I, I, I'm going to save that one for the end, and I might go digging for a slide when we get to the end. Sounds great. Plant the seed. Thank you. Yeah. I can tell you, though, if we just go back for a second uh, on that question, this, this client that I've got right here, um, their biggest focus, if you look at the very bottom sentence, reduce cycle time and lower costs. So that's, that was their KPIs. They actually knew how much like a sprint cost them. They also knew how much time it was taking from customer request to getting delivered. That's what drove their KPIs. So they had like average time to deliver so, so many points, average time to market, average cost per sprint, average cost per release. So that was the big KPIs for them. So usually I will point back to why are you doing it? And then that'll that'll flow out your KPIs because it'll tie back to what your your goal was starting out. Good, good question. Okay, then lastly, if you do foundational work and you do piloting and piloting goes well, then you can start looking at scaling up and maybe even trying to use scaled agile. I'm seeing lots of companies just jump to scaled agile and i personally have been called in as like a trainer to train people and get their agile release trains going and i've had to abort because these first two pieces were missing like people didn't understand how scrum worked but we were asking them to use scrum across 10 teams which is crazy and that's what scaled agile does you know it's actually it's actually using agile on like the program level like like numerous teams trying to integrate their work so to hop right into something like this on day one without any agile or scrum experience is is ridiculous. So even like I said, I'm a scaled agile trainer um, and uh, and like I would never have somebody just skip those first two. All right, 
So, so that's that's number one. Stop cheating. So actually do your foundation work, do some piloting. Number two, um, I don't know if any folks from the healthcare authority are out there. If you are, I miss you. It was a pleasure working with you. Hope, hope things are going well. Um, so healthcare authority, I think it was like in 2018, they, they, they were rolling out a data warehouse project uh, to do reporting. And those of you who aren't familiar with the healthcare authority, they actually are like your uh, your Medicare, Obamacare facilitators. So they make sure they keep track of stuff for the people who provide services to citizens of the state who have Medicare. So the hospitals, doctors, and so on. And then they also take care of those people who have that insurance, you and I, the individual uh, citizens of the state. So they do all kinds of reporting back to like the hospitals and doctors, and also to the citizens to kind of show where the spend is and what the trends are going on with healthcare. And they were doing tons of manual queries from their data warehouse. So all day long, getting public disclosure requests or whatever, grabbing a developer, saying, write me a SQL statement, hand coding reports, and it was getting obscene. So they came up with a project plan to do a data warehouse to try to put a lot of it online and into like Tableau reports that citizens or healthcare providers could run on their own so they could get out of the custom reporting business. And this is just like a small screenshot from the technology they started setting up. This isn't really a technology discussion. But when I got to that team, they were doing two week sprints. And this is this is a decent overview of what their two week sprints look like. And I started just observing when I got there and seeing if they were delivering their sprints and what was going on. And, the, and they worked uh, to deliver an increment of value to a customer, which is what a sprint's supposed to do. To do that in two weeks, all the steps they had to go through was impossible. So they were getting partially done, but basically all of their stories were rolling over and it would take two, like another sprint at least to actually bring things home. So I kind of asked around, I'm like, why are you using two weeks? A lot of the people I spoke to said, well, that's what we got trained on, like scrum training says two weeks. The place I used to do work, we, it was a two week sprint. So, you know, we just kind of defaulted to two weeks. So I was lucky in that their Scrum Master have worked on like data warehouse reporting projects before. And, and he and I both told the team, you know, the main goal is to deliver a subset of functionality that either healthcare providers or the citizens could use. So don't get them halfway there. Don't say I've got it, you know, the code written, but it's not tested or it's not production. Like get it all the way home so the citizens or the healthcare providers can use it. So we told the team that. And then we sat down and we said, what would it really take to get to an increment of value they would appreciate? And I don't want to go into a long data warehousing a discussion. I'm not a data warehousing expert myself, but I feel a lot stronger on it after we went through this. But we actually went through their flow and we said we've got to model the data based on what we're trying to do. We've got to actually start modeling the extracts, how we're going to extract it out of the database, how we're going to convert it, clean it up. Then we can start writing Tableau reports that actually let the citizens and the healthcare providers do something. And then once that's all done that and the details are done, the data is loaded, then we can actually take it live. And once we flow this all out, it was going to take four weeks to get to an increment of value that somebody could actually use, that we have a Tableau report done and they could actually go out and do a query on their own without having to call the state and asking for it. And again, just going back a slide, we got back to this goal. The goal is to deliver an increment of value, not, not to just say we always do two week sprints. So after we flowed everything out, we ended up creating this sprint structure. We went to four week sprints, and to make it really easy for all the various customers within the healthcare authority, we decided to go to calendar month. So that meant sometimes it was four weeks, sometimes it was five, sometimes three and a half, whatever. But when you went and talked to your internal stakeholders and said, we're talking about the November sprint, the December sprint, the January sprint, such an easy conversation, as opposed to saying it's sprint 52 and it goes from 613 to 622 and they're looking at calendars. It was so beautiful to just say calendar sprint month. And this is the structure we laid out. I worked with them, man, I think three or four months more after we laid this out. And we actually started seeing when they got done, they had the Tableau reports complete. They could put stuff into production. They truly completed an increment in a month. 
And that was the goal. So, so this is an example of what you're really supposed to do with Agile. I got trained by Jim Highsmith on Agile in the year 2000. And he actually told me this to, you know, 22 years ago, I guess it was. He was, he was telling that my team, he walked us through like a two week sprint, but he said, tailor Agile, like the story structure, sprint structure, tailor it so you meet the goals, like delivering value, not, not just following a continuous cadence always is the same. So again, Stacey, this is a great time to take questions. So just one example of how you could tailor Agile, and you should tailor Agile to your situation. I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to put a hand up? All right, Greg, let's keep going. You've got... Um, just under 15 minutes left. Perfect. So we've got um, first thing is stop cheating. Second thing is uh, to customize to your situation. And the third thing and the hardest part about moving to Agile or doing any kind of organization change is how do you motivate people to go there? So I can't see hands, uh, Stacy, but maybe people can type in the chat. How many people would love to have their name associated with saving 100,000 lives? So if you're in for that, just say yes, I would, or whatever. You can type it in the chat right now, and you can tell me what you're seeing, Stacy. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. <laughs> a lot of people out there in state service would love to save that many lives. <laughs> I, I sometimes when I do this presentation in person, people will say, does, does that have to include my in-laws? So if, if you want to exclude in-laws from your 100,000 list, you can. So. So, okay, I assume you're seeing a lot of hands up there. So everybody would be up for this. So, so interesting story. Uh, back in 2004, there's a nonprofit association in Washington, D.C. called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the IHI. And Donald Berwick was the CEO. And Donald's team went out to hospitals, doctor's offices, and started study, studying the quality of healthcare being administered. And the thing they found out was uh, one out of every 10 times somebody went to the doctor or the hospital, the doctor or the hospital made a mistake and made the patient worse. And when his team looked at how frequently that was happening, it was about 15 million instances of, a year of medical harm that was being caused by the provider. And when they did the math, they're like, some of these are so bad, people are dying. So thousands of people are dying every year because of these mistakes. And Donald Berwick was extremely fired up about this. He's like, you know what? Um, I was just reading an article on Toyota, and Toyota has a factory in Georgetown, Kentucky, that's rolling out Camrys at a defect rate, not of 10%, but 0.1% defect rate in a completely assembled car. Why is it Toyota takes the, the value or the quality of their cars higher than we take human life? What, what is up with that? So he was, he was really upset, and especially he wanted to start with the hospitals. How do we get hospitals to change their behavior? So Bill and his team went to a hospital administrators convention. And they actually presented the data. They actually said, talked about the 10% defect rate. And they said, we found six specific things that you're doing that are the main, you know, the 80-20, if you will, the main reason you're having this 10% defect rate. And if you follow our advice, we ballpark that in the next year and a half, you'll save 100,000 lives. So, so because so, much, so, much, so many of these things are so egregious, they're actually killing people. So he goes in, he presents to these hospital administrators. If memory serves, I think there's about 1,200 hospital administrators in attendance at this conference. So you would think, you know, the hospitals hear this and they would buy in. But everybody in, in the audience was kind of shaking their head. They're like, well, maybe other hospitals do that, but we don't. And, and if I do participate in making these six changes that you're suggesting, am I admitting that I have made mistakes in the past? 
And you know what? A lot of the things we do today, we've been doing them forever. They're automatic. They're ingrained. We don't want to change them. The other thing is, you know, you're just extrapolating. You're saying 100,000s of people could have died. Well, you're just guessing. So that's just a guess. So, so Bill and his team, uh, if I can go back here, Bill and his team went back to his hotel room that night and they brainstormed and they said, we're not connecting with these people at all. We're telling them about health issues and, and death and they're not reacting. And one of the members of Bill's team at IHI said, we've got to get to the right brain. We've got to get to the emotional side. We've got to make this personal for people because they are just seeing statistics. It's like looking at an Excel spreadsheet to them. It doesn't mean anything. There's no emotion connected to it. That's why they're not motivated. So they all chewed on it. And the next day, they brought in this lady. And this is Sorel King. And Sorel King is holding her daughter here, Josie. And one day in 2003, Sorel was actually like on the phone and her year and a half old daughter was just running through the house like like year and a half old kids do. And she didn't catch her, but her daughter ran into the bathroom, started pouring herself a bath and put on the hot water only and she scalded herself. And she got very severe burns. So this is I think this was in uh, Baltimore memory serves. So they, they, they called an ambulance. They rushed her to, a, uh, to the, uh, I think it was a John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And they put her on an IV and they started doing uh, improvement work for her and she started getting better. And then one day she started getting worse and they couldn't figure it out. And she eventually actually had a heart attack while she was in her hospital bed and she died. And when they started researching and investigating what happened, they found out that the hospital hadn't kept track of her hy hydration. So she basically dehydrated, which caused her to have a heart attack and for her heart to stop. A year and a half old girl. And Sorrel King took the stage and she told the 1200 hospital administrators this. And you can actually see this quote from her. She's basically like, I know you're going to support this going forward because this could be your daughter. This could be your spouse. This could be somebody in your family. This isn't statistics. This is real. My daughter is gone. It's never coming back. And I read this story in the, I think it was the Pittsburgh Gazette. And they actually said that most of the administrators were crying, like bawling after Sorrel told her story. And her story did make a difference. It actually did, the hospital administrators started talking more and, and they actually did support the change and the IHI was able to get them to start making the six specific changes that they suggested. And they actually met the same conference. It was like a every six month conference. They met a, a year and a half later and an independent group came in to assess the hospitals and how many participated. And you can see the six specific suggestions on the, the left hand side here. The first two suggestions, rapid response teams, medication, reconciliation, the data on whether things improved was weak to, weak to medium, so that wasn't definitive. But the last four, making changes for central line infection, surgical site, ventilator associated pneumonia, and so on, the data was undeniable. And the estimate was because of the changes the hospital has made in the last year and a half, 122,000 lives have been saved. So a lot of people probably ask me, <laughs> I came to learn about Agile, not to talk about stuff like this. So this does relate. Um, very first thing, like when you're moving to Agile, don't just say team, go use it. Like, do the same thing that the IHI did. Hold their hand, get into the weeds, tell them exactly what you want them to do. There's nothing wrong with micro coaching, getting into the details with the team when you're actually trying to ask them to Agile. So, so same thing here. So what they did was uh, they actually said a lot of people are dying because of ventilator associated pneumonia. And the problem is you're not keeping their, their head between 30 and 45 degrees. So they coached them to keep their heads there, and that, that had a huge impact on people not getting pneumonia and dying from it. So same thing with Agile. I meet so many agencies even who want everything. They're not specific. Like they want to like try to get iterative to delivery, lower cost, better quality. They want everything. So I highly suggest don't start with wide goals for your Agile pilot teams or even for your org. Instead, pick like one theme if you're moving to Agile. So like the example I've got here, 
This is from a client that we were just talking about. Their main goal was to reduce cycle time. And then they came up with like four supporting principles for helping to reduce cycle time. And they probably would get side benefits, better quality, faster time to market, all those things, but they'd still have one simple theme for the team, reduce cycle time. And follow these principles, you know, like keep your work in progress levels low so you're not multitasking. Increase skill sets so we don't get bottlenecked by one person. So if you're moving to Agile right now to ask you to do the same thing, pick one main theme, the main driver. You can still have secondary goals, but pick a main theme. Second thing, and which is the hardest part, how do you motivate your agency or, or your specific team to move to Agile? Nobody's probably going to die at your agency because they didn't use Agile. So you probably can't use that one. But there are other things that you can do that will connect with the right brain, the emotional side of these people and make it personal. I personally have found if you at the start tell them there are limitations and, you know, Bill made these great comments about, you know, Agile isn't always a great fit. You have that honest conversation at the start, they'll get more respect. The other thing is like show people that statistic I showed at the start that everybody's headed to Agile and you need it to be employable pretty soon. It, it is a required skill set. So, so you need this to be employable to also help you get a raise, promotion, so on. The other thing that I see helps motivate is like this core team that I talked about. If they're actually in on the ground floor building it, they'll take ownership for it. That will also motivate them as opposed to saying, you know, Greg Smith or Deloitte or somebody else is driving it. So I don't know if I believe in it or not. If they're the actual ones developing the, the workflow, then they will believe in it because they created it. Then the last thing that Donald Berwick did is he made it easy for them to go there. So he shaped the path, as we kind of call it, make it easy to, to do something, make it make it make it easy to get through the obstacles. So the hospitals only had to fill out one page to enroll. They got detailed instructions and training. Gurus would visit and coach them, and they sort of got their own communities of practice going within the hospitals without the IHI even driving it. So you can do the same thing once once you start bringing up Agile, you can start creating experts and mentors who do brown bags at lunch. They can share success at company meetings. Uh, you can have like coaches providing like detailed training, not just doing high level training, but day to day when they're coming across issues. If you are working in person or even online, you can set up the tools that make it easy to support Agile. And then a big one that I see is making sure Agile is supported across the whole org. So if they start working with other teams, they don't block them because those teams don't support Agile principles. So, so clear goals, emotional connection, make it easy for them to get there. I think I've got like maybe a minute left. Stacy, I can take some questions. Um, not sure what's out there. Exactly right. One minute uh, for questions. I'd love to entertain one more if anyone has a question for Greg. Love you. Megan does. Hi, Greg. Hey, uh, quick, quick question on the virtualness of our world now and how that how you've seen that impact um, the agile environments where co-location is so important. So your thoughts? Uh, well, this is what I would say quickly here. Let me get my deck deck back up. Um, so these are the 12 agile principles. And the only thing I see really changing is now face to face may not be the best way, may not be an option. So what's just as good as what we're doing right now. So in Zoom and like I'm using tons of tools and you guys probably are two tools like uh, tools like Mural, Miro to do like online white uh, online whiteboarding. So the only thing I'm seeing really change in Agile space is we're not doing as much face to face, you may not be able to, but the other things are still true. We still deliver in increments. We still deliver with changing requirements. We still do retrospectives to improve our process. We still focus on technical excellence. So the only thing I'm really seeing is number six. We're just not face to face, but everything else principle wise, we still support and we still do. Thank you, Greg. I do see uh, Kevin, quick question. Uh, hello. We can hello. hear you. 
Hey, um, so I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on um, Kanban versus Scrum. Which one do you think is more advantageous for one situation versus another? Oh, uh, two, two things I would say. One is uh, when I had the pleasure of working with Watek, like I think I said like eight years ago, the teams I met had all been through lean training. And that was such a good foundation before we started talking about Agile and Scrum. So if I had my druthers, first thing I would do is train people on lean and optimizing workflow and visualizing workflow. Like those are so foundational. So I would start with lean, and then I would actually take a team, once they get good at that, start using Kanban with that so they can see their workflow, they get a feel for the bottlenecks, they think about how to optimize and reduce cycle time. Then I would do Scrum on top of that if I needed to deliver like in batches or support like a project milestone. So you can use Kanban for projects too, but it's better for like day-to-day -day sustaining work, like troubleshooting, uh, help desk calls, things like that. So, so, but if I'm trying to do batches, I prefer to use uh, Scrum, but if I have just continuous flow, and especially if I need to do something quicker than a week, I like Kanban a lot better. But you can use both. Like I worked with a, a team before who actually would do Kanban, but they still had milestones. Like, like at a certain time frame, they would they would hit a milestone. Uh, the other thing too, I'd say just quickly before I go is Kanban's also good if team members come and go. Scrum wants a dedicated team, so you can forecast and predict. We know how much these ten people can deliver. But if you really can't dedicate people, then Kanban just has the work sitting there. And when somebody comes back, then they can grab it and work on it. And if they get called away, they can leave and come back. So a Kanban board will let you leave, come back, leave and come back. Scrum won't let you do that. Scrum will say, hey, we got a deadline. We got to get this done in two weeks. People can't leave. You've got to be dedicated. So, so anyway, super high level. That, that's sort of some of my thoughts on um, Scrum versus Kanban. Very helpful, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. All right.